Welcome to All Things Apostolic. This is the place for daily news about what's transpiring in the apostolic world. Not only news, but also views on current events and commentary on our world. Announcements of upcoming events across the movement. And much more, so stay tuned. Welcome to All Things Apostolic. I'm Dr. Nathaniel Wilson. And I'm glad you're with us here on this. What is this? Thursday. And uh, we have had a tremendous time already this week. On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we didn't know we were going to be going this long, but we got into the subject of, oh, brother, we're looking at the organizing principles, which there are two primary ones, I would say. I think everybody would pretty much agree um, for organizing how systematic theology is done and how we approach the bigger picture of the Bible, giving us the plan for man and uh, how we can articulate that, the big picture story. One of the ways it's that is done is what is identified as covenant theology. And the other is oftentimes identified as dispensational theology. Um, mm. Covenant theology, we went over yesterday and talked about, it started back with Zwingli and was really kind of given the first uh, uh, chair there in articulating this and formulating this. This is all the way back late 1400s and early 1500s. And um, then there was, uh, there was, uh, there's actually three covenants is why it's called covenant theology. Maybe you can just run back over that a little bit. We're glad to have Pastor Wilbanks with us. He's been with us every day this week. We've had a tremendous discussion and what a tremendous addition he has been uh, with the content and uh, the uh, input that he has brought to this uh, edition of ATA. So uh, Pastor, we're glad you're here. It's good to be here. Thanks for letting me come back. Um, what we were talking about yesterday, uh, just, just a very brief little synopsis, we were talking about uh, the non-negotiable thing uh, that we hold dear, that Christians should hold dear, and that is the necessity of Acts 2 salvation, as was preached on the day of Pentecost. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, Acts 2 is the birth of the church and the outpouring of the Spirit as promised by God in the Old Testament in many places, which we will talk about either on this recording or others. Uh, but it's, that is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit that was promised in the Old Testament. Now, the, the points that we were making yesterday with covenantalism versus dispensationalism, we, uh, we had a discussion of classic covenantalism, which there's at least two more branches of covenantalism, and then others are coming up with their own. Uh, but they all hold certain things in common. Uh, I gave one example yesterday of that thing that they hold in common, and that is that they, covenantal theologians, believe that Acts 2 was not for uh, salvation, but was for empowerment. Uh, and we, as dispensationalists, especially as oneness Pentecostals, believe that uh, it's not just for empowerment, although it is for empowerment, it is a simultaneous thing. Salvation and empowerment happen in one instant, in one performance of the Holy Ghost. We believe that both salvation and empowerment happens. So this is different than covenantal theology. Covenantal theology maintains that salvation happens uh, beginning with the covenant of grace. We'll just start there. There's some discussion as to whether or not it's redemption or grace. But beginning with the, the covenant of grace, some saying, as Bishop pointed out yesterday, some saying that that happened with the uh, with the promise seed being, or the promise of a uh, of a seed that would crush the serpent's head being given to Eve, and then some say that it began with the covenant with Abraham, but that the covenant of grace begins at that point. Um, if the covenant of grace begins at that point, what that does is it negates the necessity of salvation in Acts two. Uh, Acts 2 simply becomes something for empowerment. And the example that I gave yesterday, I gave a couple, but the one that I will reiterate today was one friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, uh, who was a covenantalist, believed and said to me, Jeremy, you, you think that was for salvation? You think Acts 2 was for salvation? I said, well, yeah, I, I do. Uh, and this demonstrates the difference between dispensational and covenantal theologies because he looked at me and he said, 
I don't, I'm not comfortable saying that Peter and the 11 that were present on the day of Pentecost, I'm not comfortable saying that they weren't saved uh, prior to that. The difference that we would make as dispensationalists is we would say that everything in the Old Testament is taking steps toward uh, maybe um, filling out, maybe developing, maybe stacking upon uh, on top of one another until coming into a funnel, into a pathway, all of it leading not merely to Calvary, but through Calvary to Pentecost. Um, our, our belief is that Pentecost is the literal crossroads of time and eternity, uh, that everything is looking to apex there, but it doesn't apex and then start down as odd as that sounds It apex and then launches, uh, so that it or that it doesn't start down. It just carries along on that apex throughout church history. Uh, people getting filled with the Holy ghost. This is what we're talking about. Acts two salvation cannot ever be in debate and dispensationalism preserves that and other forms of theology do not. Yes. Well, uh, of course, there's a little caveat there, and that is that there are many dispensationalists who do not believe in receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, but they do True. attest to what you just said, that Acts 2 is indeed uh, the trajectory to which the Correct. Old Testament pointed. Now, let me just say, this may sound uh, uh, new to some of you because most all of the uh, theology books in the 1800s and most of them in the 1900s <clears throat> that were read uh, by uh, evangelical people were written by evangelical scholars, most of which espoused uh, or many of which espoused a covenantal position of theology. So there's been uh, the, 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 the idea that the coming of the Spirit was the ultimate end to which the Old Testament is driving is not taught in many of those theology books because those theology books are written by people that don't even believe that the Holy Spirit, as it was received on the day of Pentecost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, they don't even believe it's still for us today. And that, uh, that the, the, the time when miracles and the supernatural was manifested is already passed. Now, I, I mean, I don't know why you even pray if you believe that, because if God answers prayer, it's supernaturally. So it kind of negates the, the argument. Uh, nevertheless, we would, we would say very strongly and, 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 and confidently that the Old Testament points its primary arrow to Acts 2. Now, its intention was that the Jews would accept the Messiah and all the promise, but that would not have changed what happened in Acts 2 because all the Old Testament promises are that Jesus would come, he would, uh, he would die, be buried, resurrect, and then his spirit would come back to dwell in us. The ultimate goal was not just his death, nor just his burial, nor just his resurrection. The ultimate goal was that he would live in us because he was in the process of creating a new body, not his physical body, but what the Bible itself explicitly calls the body of Christ, which is the church and of which we are 1 Corinthians 12 members in particular. So when you look at the Old Testament, from the lens that we are looking at it, and that is as an apostolic Pentecostal believer, then all these scriptures begin to come out very clearly. Of course, the, the mo most well-known would be Joel 2, 28, 29, which Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost when he said, this that you're receiving is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. So, you know, we would have to say either this is that or this isn't that. But Joel was talking about the coming of the Spirit upon Israel and upon its sons and upon its daughters and upon its maidens and, and handmaidens and servants that the Holy Ghost would come upon them. Isaiah 28, 11 and 12 tells us the prophet prophesied, for with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak unto this people. And this is the rest which whereby the weary shall be made to rest. 
So stammering lips and other tongues was prophesied in the Old Testament. Now somebody said, oh, that's not talking about speaking in tongues like you're talking about. Well, the Apostle Paul thought it was because he quotes that scripture talking about speaking in tongues, discussing speaking in tongues in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So indeed it does um, and was intended as a prophecy about uh, the coming of speaking in tongues and it being tied to the rest. And there's many other scriptures, Ezekiel chapter 37, where it's, it's Ezekiel's boneyard and the great revival. I think it's verse 14 there says, and this is the whole house of Israel. So this was promised to Israel that this would come eventually. Well, when Israel rejects the Messiah as a nation nationally, not every individual, then we know that God turned to the Gentiles and he's taken out of people of the Gentiles for his namesake. And on the day of Pentecost, those Jews that believed received the Holy Ghost. And it was the fulfillment of that entire Old Testament uh, like a laser heading to a New Testament fulfillment of people receiving the Holy Spirit. This is why even in the New Testament, John the Baptist said, there's one coming after me who's mightier than I, who shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And then Jesus himself talks to the disciples and tells them in John chapter 20, he breathed on them. He was showing them how the Holy Ghost was going to come and said, receive ye uh, the Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Ghost is the breath of God, the wind. That's why when it did come in Acts chapter two, it came like a sudden uh, rushing mighty breath, the mighty wind of God. And, um, and uh, Acts eight tells us that that Holy Ghost is the spirit of Jesus. The Greek actually says spirit of Jesus. So um, uh, there's probably there's probably a number of other, I mean, not, there's not probably, there is a number of other Old Testament scriptures, Zechariah and others. And, um, give us another main one there, General Pastor, you got something in your mind? That... Probably, the, probably the most prominent one, or one of the most prominent ones, one of the most clearly stated ones is probably, I would, I think we'd both probably say Jeremiah 31, um, 31 through uh, 34. Yes. Uh, this is what it says. Uh, behold, this is Jeremiah prophesying to Israel uh, in their in their uh, exile in Babylon. Behold, the days come. This is verse 31, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And then if we skip down to verse 33, this is what it says. And we believe all of this is fulfilled uh, demonstrably in Acts 2. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. This is, we, the fulfillment of this is in Acts chapter two. It's no mistake that these are devout Jews from every, that come to Jerusalem for the feast from all over the known world. And this, the Holy Ghost being poured out becomes the fulfillment of what Jeremiah prophesied in chapter 31, that it's the law uh, coming into their inward parts. It's being written on their heart, no longer written on tables of stone, but it's being written on the fleshy tables of their heart. Uh, the fulfillment of this, of course, and Hebrews cites this. It's the longest, uh, we've talked about this often. It's the longest uh, quote of the Old Testament in the New Testament. Uh, this is the this is fulfilled at Pentecost. The law coming inward is fulfilled in Acts two with the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy, and it happens in Acts two. Yeah. So, um, so you know, sometimes a, a, a covenant theologian would sincerely say that well, they received. Uh, there's examples, numerous examples in the Old Testament, people being filled with the Spirit or the Spirit being in one, or the Spirit being on somebody. And so they would say, well, this idea of the Holy Spirit coming on people or um, infilling them is not new uh, right. to the New Testament. It's found in the Old Testament also. So, um, I mean... But dispensationalists you, would say different in a, in a different way. Well, we would say the the classic way dispensationalists would talk about that would be to say that in the Old Testament, the spirit would come upon someone possibly to perform a task, uh, 
uh, or, or to operate in prophecy, etc. Uh, one of the passages, uh, maybe we cited this yesterday, one of the passages is, for example, in Psalm 51, uh, when David is repenting for his sin with Bathsheba, and he prays and he asks God, don't remove your Holy Spirit, take not your Holy Spirit from me, uh, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. So there is, there is, um, there is a sense in the Old Testament where people have the Holy Ghost on them, uh, but it's not the same sense that we get in the New Testament, uh, where Jesus talks about the uh, where Jesus has to be glorified before the Holy Ghost can be poured out indiscriminately. Yeah, well, a lot of non-Pentecostals uh, would say that the Holy Spirit came upon them, and sometimes it says it came in them in the Old Testament. Uh, but they would also say, and here's where we agree, that it was for empowerment. Yes. That it didn't have anything to do in the Old Testament with uh, any soteriological significance, it, uh, no salvation significance, to which we would agree. It was an empowerment that was primarily placed upon leaders. However, when Eldad and Medad in the book of Numbers began to prophesy uh, and Joshua got all upset about it and went to Moses and said, you need to stop these people from prophesying, which is the same anointing as speaking in tongues. And um, what did Moses say? Moses said, uh, would to God that all of God's people prophesied yeah. and that all were anointed with the spirit. Uh, so, which was a prophecy in itself of the coming of the day of Pentecost, when when all people would. So it is an enablement, but when you get in the New Testament, there's something more than that. Go ahead. This is so so scripture. This is Jesus Christ Himself. This is the way He talked about it. Um, in uh, John seven, He said, verse thirty seven, He said, "In the last day, very very familiar passage of scripture for any Bible scholar. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying." If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Uh, the very next verse, verse 39, in, in your King James, it's got it in parenthesis. But this spake he of the Spirit. In other words, the living water uh, that he talked about with the woman at the well. Uh, this living water uh, is, is the Spirit. That's what he's talking about. A wellspring. It comes out. It's a wellspring that comes out. It's living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. This is, and this is what it says. This is where we, can, where we draw a distinction between the Holy Ghost in the New Testament and the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified, meaning he hadn't been resurrected and had not ascended uh, to his glorification yet. So in the Old Testament, it, is it the same Holy Spirit? Yes, it's the same Spirit. But it's for purpose. It's possibly, probably we could say that it comes on an individual for that purpose or for prophecy. But in the New Testament, in the New Testament, we understand that it's not given broadly or serendipitously <laughs> because Jesus has not yet been glorified. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, I have a question for you. Uh, you're a Greek scholar, and that's not an overstatement. <laughs> what does it mean when it's in italics, the word given? That means that that's, uh, that word was, the word given there uh, is not, does not show up as an individual word in Greek. Okay, uh, well, would you reread it for us without the addition of the King James translators that thought it ought to be there, but admit that that's not in the original? Yes, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, so that's pretty significant. And it doesn't mean that there was no Holy Ghost, we all know that. But the Holy right. Ghost as it is found in the New Testament was not yet, because it depended on the glorification of Jesus. And we're almost out right. of time. But... But why did it depend on the glorification of Jesus? Get this, because the Holy Ghost, you know, people sometimes say, why don't you call it the Holy Spirit? It's, it's really the right name. And I, I, I concede that, except I still call it the Holy Ghost. The reason is, is because the ghost is the spirit of a departed one that comes back to help or haunt you. And so when we're talking about the Holy Ghost in the New Testament, we're not just talking about the spirit of God as we see it in the Old Testament. 
We're talking about the spirit of the glorified, glorified. Christ yes. risen. And just like he was, just like he was man in flesh and, and, and spirit, he is also in the spirit. There is the, the, the glorified human spirit of Christ and, uh, and, and his divinity. And so to get, to get the Holy Ghost in the New Testament, you get the whole thing after the glorification. And that's why it is salvific in the New Testament and not in the Old Testament, because, right. because salvation comes by Jesus Christ, yes. our, our propitiation for our sins, coming inside of us by his spirit. In the Old Testament, the spirit of Adam had died. And so the Bible says we, we are dead in trespasses and sins until we come to God. But then we come to God, we receive the life. There we go. You must be born again. So when the life comes in by the new birth, why would we think the new birth is anything else than the reception of the spirit as they received it in Acts 2? I can't figure that out. So somebody that doesn't agree with me today, find the places where, where, where the Bible identifies being born again. That is more exacting than receiving the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost 